All right, let's take a look at the relay, especially its operating principles, some practical considerations, as well as interface circuit design. Let's take a quick review of the relay device. This device provides low power control of a high power device or circuit. For example, supposing we have a digital controller, such as the NI MyRio as an example, with a digital output level of 3.3 volts and the ability to drive uh, about 4 milliamps. When you take the product of those two values, you have 13 milliwatts. Now suppose we wanted to have digital control over three light bulbs, each of which is plugged into the 120 volt mains, and each of which has a power level of 120 watts. That's a total of 360 watts to make all three lights come on, clearly much higher than 13 milliwatts. Consequently, the relay serves as a bridge between the low power and the high power circuits. The relay consists of two parts, a coil, which is really an electromagnet, and a switch, which is operated by this electromagnet. I'm going to break the connection of this circuit here so we can place the switch in series. That means that when the switch is closed, the lights will come on. Relays can handle generally amps or more. The electromagnet requires about a tenth of an amp to activate the switch, which is still considerably higher than what's available from the digital controller. Therefore, we still need an, another intermediary here. The relay driver circuit establishes a connection between the digital device and the electromagnet. Now let's look into the design of the interface circuit itself. First, we need a little better understanding of what's happening with the relay. Here we have the electromagnet coil, pair of terminals available for that. Here we have the switch contacts. We have the common, a spring that holds the switch in one position, and the spring is providing a restoring force when the coil pulls down that end of the switch. So one side of the switch is normally closed, while the other is normally open. Now to better understand how we ultimately need to design the interface circuit, let's start out with a simplified version based on a battery and a switch to control the coil. When the switch is closed, we provide a path for current to flow, and the battery provides the motive power for current to circulate in that circuit. Now, once we have established the current in the coil, we are storing energy in the magnetic field associated with that coil. The energy is one half times the inductance times the square of the current. Essentially, we can say that energy is proportional to squared current. Now imagine that we open the switch again. Now the open switch tells us that we ought to have zero current in the circuit. But zero current would mean that we have zero energy in the coil because the switch current and the coil current are the same thing. Somehow we need to get this stored energy in the magnetic field to go away. Well, it will return to the circuit somehow, but the question is, how does that actually happen? Now, if we do nothing special, this coil will continue to force current through the switch, and it will do so in such a way that it actually causes an arc to be established as the switch opens up. That's, that means thousands of volts to cause arcing. Now, the voltage of the switch would look like a large positive voltage, while the voltage across the coil would look like a large negative voltage. This is also known as back EMF. EMF means electromotive force. Now this high voltage that can cause arcing on a physical switch is definitely going to cause problems on a solid state switch. Now to help figure out how to deal with this 
problem, let's take another view of the coil as an inductor now. That means the coil voltage is proportional to the time rate of change of the coil current. When the switch is closed, we have a constant current, but when you open the switch, you're trying to force the current down to zero. That means you have a very large negative slope. Since the voltage is proportional to the time rate of change of the current, that means this large negative slope is gonna show up as a huge voltage spike in the negative direction. Again, this can be in the thousands of volts range, and eventually it can start to cause damage to a transistor instead of our physical switch. So let me place a diode in this strategic location. Under normal operation, the diode would be reverse biased and does not pass any current. The current then is established through the coil as it was before. Again, this is with the switch closed. Now, open the switch and see what happens. At this point, the coil is trying to force current, can't force it through the switch though, but fortunately the diode is there, ready to go in the forward bias direction, and it provides an alternative path for the current to flow. That means that the current gets dumped through this diode, that dissipates the stored energy inside the coil, and it protects the switch from arcing. And again, it would pr protect our solid state switch from long-term damage. So I'm gonna replace the switch with a transistor, replace the battery with our power supply. Power supply is VDD with this polarity. The plus side is normally drawn like this symbol for the power supply connection, and the negative side is our ground. Take the battery out. The switch here would then be replaced with either an NPN bipolar junction transistor or we could use an N-channel enhancement MOSFET. Now with that background information in hand, we can take a look at the details of the interface circuits. I have two sets, two for the MSP mini systems port on the MyRio and the MXP, MyRio expansion port. Those are active low, while the MSP versions are active high. Now, the difference between the two is based on the fact that the MXP connectors have internal pull-up resistors while the MSP has internal pull-down resistors. Now the MyRio starter kit relay specifically is a five volt coil. That means we need to attach it to the MyRio five volt supply. Based on my measurements, the coil resistance is approximately 56 ohms. That means that when the coil is active, we have a current from the supply to ground of 90 milliamps. This is well within the capabilities of the 2N3904 as well as the ZVN2110 and also for their complementary devices over here. When the transistor switches off, we have 90 milliamps that needs to flow through the diode. That's the 1N4001. And it has plenty of ca capability to handle 90 milliamps. Now let's take a look at the significance of pull down versus pull up resistors on the DIOs. On the MSP side, we have pull-down resistors of approximately 37K up, up to 40K, and that's true on each DIO. Now, these become evident whenever the DIO is in input mode, and that happens anytime after cycling the power on the MyRio or after a MyRio reset in software. Normally, we do not want the relay coil energized until software has control of the output. Now as we look at the base circuit for this, we see clearly that the device is off. There's, there's nothing to activate the base. In the case of the MOSFET version, there's nothing to activate the gate either. So the transistors are both off in that case. Everything looks fine. Now as we look at the MXP port with its internal pull-up resistors, 
these are of essentially the same value as what we had on the MSP side. Those are pulling up to 3.3, 3.1 volts thereabouts. Now this is lower than the 5 volt supply that's being used to operate the relay coil. Now looking at that difference between 5 and 3.1 volts, it's clear that the transistor is active, but the question is, is it active enough in order to power the coil? Turns out that it's not, and so we can rest assured that the coil stays off. For the P-channel version, looking at the gate source voltage right here, we need a gate source voltage below minus 1.9 volts. Comparing this value to 3.1 minus 5, looks like it could be just barely past threshold, but it's not enough to activate the coil. Therefore, the coil will be off after a MyRio reset or after cycling the power.